Okay, I'm going to try to do the letter to the Church of Smyrna now, getting back to Revelation. I, I've been wanting to do this, but I swear every time I want to do stuff, uh, my family gets a snow day or there's a funeral or something like that, and everybody is in here in my face all the time. I'm really frustrated. I don't know that I'm even going to be able to get through this video. I've got a wild six-year-old who won't leave me alone, and the dogs are barking, and it's just it's driving me nuts. I don't have a plan for this. Uh, I've got some ideas. We'll see how it goes. And after I'm done, I'll post it if I think it's worth anything. But I, I just feel like I've, I haven't gotten to do anything on YouTube in a little bit because there's just so many distractions. So please pray for me. Uh, you know, I on the other hand, I, I believe that the Lord orders our steps and there's perfect timing for everything. And this Smyrna one was kind of hard for me because I didn't want to just repeat what I've heard other people say. And so I just was kind of waiting to see what is it the Lord wants to say about this epistle, right? So we talked about the letter to the church in Ephesus. And as I've said, these letters are written to seven churches in Asia. And in Asia, there was extreme amounts of spiritual warfare. And we know that by the time that John wrote these, uh, Paul had already said that the church had departed churches in Asia had departed from his ministry or all in Asia had departed from his ministry. It was Jews from Asia that came and stirred up the riots in Acts uh, 21 and put an end to his public ministry among the churches. However, these are still churches, lampstands shining with the brightness of the Lord's testimony in a dark and crooked age. And, Smyrna, he has nothing bad to say about this church. So these letters are written, remember, to a mix of overcomers, angels who are the messengers of the Lord, and they're addressed really to those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, which is apparently not, excuse me, everybody in the church. Um, and then some of these churches are a mix of unbelievers and believers because they are assemblies of people that have come together in the name of Jesus, but not everybody believes. We see that all through the epistles of the apostles, that there are unbelievers in their midst. So there's a clear dividing line between the unbelievers and those he calls overcomers, which are the same as those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, right? And... Uh, in Smyrna, as far as we know, everybody in there was an overcomer. They were all a believer. And like I said, he has nothing bad to say to them. Now, Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, the word comes from the word myrrh, um, which has to do with suffering. Myrrh was included in the anointing, uh, are included in the gifts that they gave to Jesus at the time of his birth. Myrrh was what he was uh, embalmed with um, myrrh in the scriptures speaks of suffering and death okay and that's of course appropriate now remember these name these churches are named according to the city that they dwell in and the city was not uh, Jewish choices these were Gentile choices many times hundreds of years that city's already been there when this epistle is written and yet it becomes the the name of the city summarizes the situation of the church at the time John wrote this, which is a excellent proof of the sovereignty of God. Um, how he arranges all the details in even Gentile history to work all things together for good to the carrying out of his purpose. Um, the other thing is remember that these churches, while they were seven little churches that existed in Asia at the time he wrote it, they are seven periods of church history in advance mapped out, which if they were put in another order, that would not be the case. And the first three of the churches have no reference to his coming and the promise to the overcomer is at the end of the letter, whereas the last four have a specific reference to his coming and the promise to the overcomer is included in the body of the letter before the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches, meaning that the reward to the overcomer may actually be given to them at the time when Jesus comes and they may live to see it. That's how I look at that. Because the only time that 
having an ear to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches is um, a practical thing is when you're alive. Because once we are dead, we don't need discernment anymore. We'll be in the presence of the Lord and we'll know as we are known. But on this side, because we see through a glass darkly, we need the ear to hear our shepherd's voice. We need the ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And there are some among us who don't have that ear. So the, the letters break up with, like here, look at uh, verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit spirit says to the churches and then he says he who overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death well to me that means that the promise to the overcomer here is for for this church a matter of something that wouldn't be achieved in their lifetime but she i hate to word achieve but you know what i'm saying versus thyatira which is the first church where he specifically mentions his coming he moves the promise to the overcomer into the body of the letter. He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power to the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, etc. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's put at the end of the letter. Okay? Um, because they may very well live until the Bema seat. And those, re those rewards to the overcomers are related to the Bema seat. And I'm going to probably talk about it in this message that I don't think that there's all these different award rewards that you can strive for according to your works. I believe that Christ is our reward and all of the overcomers get all of these things. Um, all the believers, this is our heritage, our inheritance and our reward, which is all they're all related to things of Christ himself. Um, and every believer has them in common. So, for example, the reward to the Smyrna is he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Well, does that mean that the church, the overcomer in uh, Philadelphia will be hurt of the second death? Absolutely not. None of us will because we all have a part in the first resurrection. So, really, you can go through them and see that they are all things that we all have in common as our destiny in the body of Christ. And then there's these so-called five crowns, which we may talk about a little bit today because he mentions the crown of life. But interestingly for Smyrna, he puts the crown of life before he who has an ear, let him hear to this, uh, what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's no reference to his coming, but apparently these could receive a crown of life uh, even though, in other words, that is not part of these he that overcomes shall not be heard of this and he that overcomes shall eat of the tree of life. There's something different for the church in Smyrna, a crown of life that James also refers to a crown of life. We'll, we'll talk about that. It's, a, it's supposedly the same crown, but it's interesting that this is something that they can have while they're alive. That's I believe that that is meant for since it's in the body of the letter, before he that has an ear that hear, based on the way these church letters are outlined, I believe that that is a promise um, for those who are in this life and in a similar situation to Smyrna, but we'll, we'll talk about it. So Smyrna means suffering, right? Let's just read it. Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, these things says the first and the last, which was dead, and is alive. Now he's pointing to his resurrection. And again, this is one of the pieces of the seven things he says about himself in the vision in first in the first chapter where John turned and saw the vision of the Lord and he had this description of him and he had all these different features. And each of the features becomes part of the address based on the situation to one of these churches. I mean, the design of this is staggering. Okay, then he says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not and are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear not any of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you will be given tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, first of all, 
He, the beginning and the end of the letter point to Christ as the resurrection and point to the promise of resurrection, that first resurrection, because they're going to go through tribulation, suffering. And he tells them they, they're going to be faithful unto death, or he says, be faithful unto death, right? Now, the life that we've received means that we won't go through the second death. The second death is the lake of fire at the end when God throws everybody in there whose name wasn't found in the book of life. Um, the first resurrection is everybody who does not have a part in the second death. And that is everybody, no matter when they were resurrected, from the time that Jesus rose from the dead until the body of Christ is complete and the um, also the... Israel receives their dead back to life. And anyone who dies during the uh, millennium and is raised again, who believes in Jesus and is saved, I believe, will be part of the first resurrection. He says, blessed is holy, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. For such, the second death will have no power. Okay. Now, here it says, he who overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. And I belong to a group that told us that we could be hurt of the second death if we didn't overcome. And, and overcoming, again, was, point, was a matter of works. Um, First John was written by the same person who wrote the book of Revelation. And he was the one with the authority to understand what an overcomer is. And he told us in First John that who is he that overcomes but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We've overcome the world because greater is he that is in us than he who's in the world. They say, well, that's just overcoming the world. Well, everything in these letters that's an assault or an attack on the church, which has to be overcome, is, a, is, is because of the effect of the world system on the church. It is overcoming the world. In this case, it's overcoming persecution and tribulation. Okay, so um, that's just kind of interesting. But to be hurt of the second death would mean to be annihilated by it, or and, and it hurts. <laughs> it's a lake of fire. Um, no believer is, who's a partaker of the first resurrection will have any part in the second death, nor will they be hurt by it. So it's amazing to me how we can take a, a f verse in the scripture and twist it around to our own harm, so that if we say... He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Instead of seeing that as a positive phrase, we go, oh, well, that means if I don't overcome, I could be hurt of the second death. As if the opposite is always true, and that's what we gravitate towards. Can't you see that that's Satan? And uh, one thing I was talking about in my mind today to myself was that the way to overcome in the scriptures and rightly divide is to take it for granted that you're saved from everything related to the wrath of God because you're in Christ. Then when you go read verses, take that as your assumption. So when you read, he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death, you don't try to apply that to yourself. <laughs> he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. How can you read that and then fear being hurt of the second death? Well, it's because the devil tells you right there, well, you're not an overcomer. No, I am an overcomer. Greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John was qualified to define that for us, don't you think? He's the one who wrote this book and the book that has the teaching and the doctrine and the declaration of what these things mean. So thank God for John, because he explains everything in his epistles. Always go to the epistles. The, epi uh, the epistles teach us the doctrine that show us how to interpret everything that's not doctrine. This isn't really doctrine. These are, these are not teachings. These are what the Lord said. These are admonishments and encouragements. But the only way to properly understand admonishment and encouragement is to have good doctrine. And for that, you need to be in the epistles. Because that's where everything is explained. And so we take what Paul and John and Peter said for granted about the Christian life. And how does get one get saved? And can we lose our salvation? And it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works. We take that for granted when we read the rest of the Bible. It's amazing how many people will take those things, believe them while they read them, and then when they go to another part of the Bible, 
throw out all those rules and say, okay, well now it's faith plus works. You know, it was only faith without works, except when I'm reading in Paul's epistles, but when I'm back in Genesis or in Revelation, it's faith plus works. How can you say that? Well, the only way you can say that is that I don't believe Paul applies to anything <laughs> other than when I'm reading Paul. If I read something else, I have to throw him out the window. That's not, that's not healthy. We got to keep the foundation and stand on it. Stand on the foundation that's laid in the apostles and the prophets. Remember, they laid the foundation. Christ is the cornerstone, but he's building on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and their teaching concerning who he is and what he's accomplished. That's our foundation and that's what we stand on. So when we read this, he that overcomes shall not be hurt at the second death. I'm going to stand on that foundation that I believe that I am an overcomer because I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I get that from an epistle in my doctrine and I see this and I say, therefore, I shall not be hurt of the second death, period. I'm a believer. Okay, so there's that. Now, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Now, that's the exact opposite of what he says to Laodicea, right? Remember to the church of Laodicea, he said, because you say that you are, uh, because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and know not that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. See? They were the exact opposite. Whereas Smyrna says... I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So they were outwardly poor, like the ones that James talked about. Those who were poor in this world, God has chosen to be rich in faith. He says, but you are rich. Now, tribulation, does this mean they're going through the great tribulation? No. Everybody who enters the kingdom, who becomes a partaker of Christ, will endure tribulation. Affliction from the enemy Persecution from the world, wrestling in ourselves between our flesh and our spirit, all of it is a kind of suffering. Our whole life is a kind of suffering in this age. This is not the age of our glory. This is really the age of our humiliation where we walk by faith and not by what we see. And we just trust the Lord even though we suffer. And this is what they were doing. And they apparently had a tribulation that was really related to persecution. Because the next thing he says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan. Now remember, I said it was Jews from Asia that troubled Paul and brought his public ministry to an end when they went to Jerusalem and raised up a riot. They were, they turned all the churches in Asia against him, Judaizing them like in Antioch. Um, they were going around from church to church, slandering, accusing, calling grace a license to sin, bringing people under the law, all of that. They were troubling the believers and that creates tremendous affliction. Okay. That, tr that produces tribulation. Um, and he says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not out of the synagogue of Satan. Now I've talked about this before that the synagogue of satan is made up of these jews which say they're not and do lie it's mentioned twice in uh is it not? yeah twice in these um letters uh it's also mentioned in philadelphia and he said philadelphia is the other church that he has nothing bad to say about and both of them wrestle with these jews who say they are Jews, but are not, but do lie. He says in Phil the church in Philadelphia, the wording's a little different. Um, kind of all over. Let's see. Uh, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are not and do lie. Behold, I will make them worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Then when you back up here, it's, uh, I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not. He doesn't say a lie there, but he just says, look, they're not Jews, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. Satan has a synagogue. And these people, there's, there's the Judaizers, but really anyone who wants to bring you under law is not a true Jew. And remember in Romans 2, he says the true Jew is the one who uh, serves in the spirit and his circumcision is not a matter of the flesh, but in the heart and in the spirit. What is circumcision? I don't have time to get into it here, but Philippians 3 says, beware the dogs, beware the concision, 
uh, beware the mutilators, uh, beware the Judaizers, for we are the true circumcision who boast in Christ Jesus, serve by the Spirit of God, and have no confidence in the flesh. The true circumcision is the one who has absolutely zero confidence in religious attainments of any kind, but seeks to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is out of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. And uh, the righteousness which is out of God and based on faith. And we count everything as dung, especially our reputation in this world, on the ex uh, based on you know, laying hold of Christ and the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Everything is refuse to us. We are not seeking to establish our own righteousness. And when you accuse us of things, we're not going to sit here and try to vindicate ourselves or manipulate things to make ourselves look better. We just run to Jesus and hide in him. His blood answers every accusation and our conscience is settled. So I don't have to answer you. If you say, you know, Hey, I was watching a video and I saw behind you there was a picture of what looked like a, uh, um, I don't know, uh, it looked like an all-seeing eye to me, you know. I don't have to then explain to someone, well, no, I'm not actually an Illuminati, I, I just have this picture, which I don't. But I get these kind of things where people are looking at people's stuff and trying to make these judgments. Though nobody owes you an explanation because their gospel is their explanation. If I correctly handle the word and proclaim Christ as my righteousness and seek only to be found in him, there's nothing anyone can say to me. And I don't know anyone ex explanation but the name of Jesus in the blood. Now, I'm not talking about practicing sin. I'm saying that we don't know an explanation because we are hiding in Christ. And people are always trying to accuse us of all kinds of things. And that's what the Jews who lie, they're not Jews, but they want to be Jews. They think they're Jews. Why are they not Jews? They may be genetically Jews, or they may be churchmen who want to be Jews. Either way, they're trying to establish a relationship to God through their own righteousness and boasting in their uncircumcised flesh rather than being the true circumcision that has no confidence in the flesh and is, is seeking to be found not in my own righteousness, but in Christ. Not having my own righteousness, that, which is out of the law, but that which is out of God and based on faith. To be found in Christ, found living Christ. The Jews who say they are Jews and do not, and are, are not, do lie. Some people think, well, that's the Illuminati and the Masons and all that stuff. And I'm not saying it's not, but these were in the churches and among the churches. Um, and I believe it refers to people who boast in their own righteousness. And eventually God's going to make them worship before the feet of Philadelphia to show that he has loved his church and everyone's going to know the difference, you know? Um, so they have a blasphemy. I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews that are not in July. They blaspheme the grace of God and they say that the grace of God is just a license to sin. And they blaspheme the saints, saying that all manner of evil things about us, accusing of it, us of all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's ridiculous. And you know who else is going to do that is Antichrist. He's going to blaspheme God and blaspheme his holy saints in heaven. So that's the synagogue of Satan. Satan's in charge of that deal. And ultimately, Satan's synagogue is going to be manifested in Antichrist. And they caused a lot of trouble for the Christians. Um, and then he says, Fear none of those things which you are to suffer. Behold, the devil of you shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and will have ten, uh, tribulation ten days again. It doesn't mean they're in tribulation. It means that the Christian life has tribulations. And not only that, but there may be a chance where you have to be faithful to, unto death. Uh, we're not in the Great Tribulation right now, but I'm glad I don't live in China or in Saudi Arabia or somewhere where I would have to give my life for my testimony. And, you know, there was a story of a guy who said, well, he was getting ready to go to be burned the next day. And I think he was in jail with Polycarp, maybe, or John, the apostle. And he said, I can't do it. He, he apparently, like, tried to light a match and burned his finger and said, I can't, there's no way I can be burned at the stake. And... The, the older brother told him, look, 
um, you'll have the grace you need when you need it. In other words, don't worry about tomorrow. You'll you'll go through whatever you need to go through. Um, because the grace comes for the believers. And you will endure whatever you need to endure. Even though, if I were to describe to you all the things that you'd have to endure for Christ, you wouldn't even want to come. So God lets us go through things sometimes without warnings. But when it's greater things, he does give us warning. And we say, Some people say, well, he gave them this warning because it's like, you know, if they did denied his name and didn't endure unto death, then they were they would lose their salvation and be hurt of the second death and wouldn't overcome. No, he didn't tell them that as a test. He told them that so they wouldn't be offended. Uh, look at John 16. Uh, the end of church at the end of uh, chapter 15 in John, he says, um, if I had not done them among the world, see, he's talking about the, if you are the world, the world would love its own because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they do to you for my name's sake, because they know not him who sent me. If I had not come spoken to them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hates me hates my father also. If I had not done them among them the works which no other man did, they would not have sinned. But now they've both seen and hated both me and my father. This comes to pass that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the comfort has come, who I sent from the father, even the Holy Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the father, he will testify of me and you will bear witness because you've been with me. And then he says, these things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whoever kills you, you will think that he does God's service. These things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I said not to you at the beginning because I was with you. Okay. So what is he saying here? He's saying, look. You're going to go through tribulation, and I want you to remember that I told you in advance. And the reason I'm telling you in advance is not a warning not to endure these things or else you'll get screwed. No, it's because I don't want you to be offended. Because these people are going to be doing this with a religious fervor. These are the Jews who say they are Jews but are not, but do lie. The synagogue of Satan who stirs up this particular brand of circum uh, I'm sorry persecution against the saints because they hate the Lord and they hate his righteousness and they hate those who believe in his method of justifying sinners and they hate that we cling to Christ as our righteousness and refuse to answer them according to the law right and they stir up trouble and persecution for us and some people will be eventually put to death because of this. And he wants you to know that you should not be offended, even though they think they're doing this in the name of God. They're not, this is not, God is not on their side. That's really the thing. When you have persecution coming from the world, it's kind of easier to understand. You know, they hate God and they're just clueless anyway. But when it's with religious people with a Bible in their hand and they've got tons of scripture and arguments and they're coming after you with hatred, it's possible that that could really trouble you and scare you. I've been persecuted in churches and kicked out and it was devastating to me because I didn't fully understand that God was on my side. I thought I must, maybe they were right, you know. All of them had plausible accusations that I believed because I didn't know how to take it for granted that I was the righteousness of God in Christ and I can hide in Christ and that's my foundation. I'm not seeking to be justified by men. I'm crucified to the world. Now I'm a little better and I won't be as easily stumbled by these kind of things. But Jesus, one of the chief encouragers is when you see in the word that you're being persecuted exactly as the Lord said it would happen. And he tells you in advance so that when it comes, the comforter uses that word to strengthen you. See, he not only uses the word and says, look, remember that I told you these things, but he says, when the comforter has come, I will send from the father, which proceeds from me. He will testify of me. That comforter will comfort you. 
and bring to remembrance the word the Lord has spoken to you. Because we are his sheep, because we are the overcomers, because we are those who hear his voice and will not hear the voice of a stranger, because we hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, the words, if they're spoken to us, become a comfort to us, even though they sound like trouble. Because the Spirit ministers the comfort. You say, well, I'm not, I never felt that when I was reading Smyrna. That's because it didn't apply to you. You're like that guy who looked at his finger after you know burning it on a match and said, I can't endure that kind of persecution. And the older brother said, in the comforting word of someone who knew the Spirit, um, said, oh, you'll have the grace to go when you go through it. And so that's what he's doing in um, Revelation, the letter to the Smyrna, he's giving them the word in advance so that when it happens, they will not be offended. He's telling them that he knows the source of their trouble, that these Jews who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie are blaspheming and they're the source of your trouble. And some of you will be put into prison and even unto death, right? And you'll have tribulation. Okay. Why is he saying that? Well, based on John again, I can see that he's saying that so that they won't be offended. And so that the comforter will take these words and minister strength to them when they need it. So if it doesn't apply to you right now, just take it. If you read it and say, oh my gosh, tribulation and persecution, I can't do that. Then you're not in the right, that, that word must not be for you, you know, right now. But... I tell you, if you contend for the gospel, it will be. If you start contending for the faith, you will experience persecution. People will do hit videos on you. People will start trying to mess with your personal life. You look at what's happening to um, a certain sister. Some of these awful channels are digging around in her, digging around for anything they can to use about her personal life to even interfere with her personal life. To the point where some of them have called her work. Some of them, I mean, they hate her, hate her, hate her. And if they could kill her, they would. But the Lord is protecting her. Tim Henderson, he's assaulted everywhere he goes. You know, some people will. He doesn't say all of you are going to be put into prison and, uh, and need to be faithful to death. He says some of you. You know, the Lord knows who can do deal with it and who can't. But they're all going to suffer. We're all suffering because of the persecution of the Jews who say they are not and do lie, these blasphemers. We all do if we believe in grace and contend for it. Now, the 10 days, if you look at church history, um, you can look at Chuck Missler's notes for this, but there was apparently 10 emperors, I think from Nero up until the one, was it Trajan? I don't know, right before Constantine, uh, that there were successive persecutions in, in the empire where they tried to stamp out Christians. So it does refer prophetically to a period of time between like 200 AD or even maybe a hundred AD. Yeah, of course Paul and Peter were martyred um, to the time of Constantine when it became the state religion. Christianity was instead of trying to be stomped out through persecution was flattered and raised up to be made part of the empire. And that we'll see in the Church of Pergamum, which is this mixed marriage um, that characterizes the next couple hundred years. But this seems to go from the time of like the apostles all the way to the time that the church started to come out of the caves. Uh, but at the time in Smyrna that this applied, when it was a literal church in that literal city, they were dealing with the Jews who say they are not and do lie these blaspheming Jews who are uncircumcised. Um, okay, so now, be faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Again, I said that that seems to be in the body of the letter, which means I believe it's something that you can enjoy even in life, even though, obviously, it's uh, be faithful unto death. Um, but in James, uh, the crown of life appears... Uh, blessed is the man who endures temptation for he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them who love him um, now this temptation 
is not necessarily the same kind of temptation you see in Smyrna. Because it's talking about temp uh, temptation in the midst of uh, temptation to sin, I believe. Yeah, every man is tempted when he's drawn away from his own lust and enticed. And yet, the same crown, if you want to call it that, is given for enduring unto death, being faithful unto death, or uh, being tempted and overcoming a temptation to sin. So, are these crowns as specific as everybody thinks they are? You know, a lot of people have turned crowns into another meritorious work system, which I believe is against what we're taught to do in the scripture. First of all, uh, in Romans 4, where it talks about if Abraham was justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. And what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works is the reward reckoned of grace. Not, uh, I'm sorry. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. It's interesting that the reward here is supposed to be of grace. Even the reward is of grace. Justification, by the way, is ultimately for the Bema Seat. If it doesn't justify you there, what good is it? Some people think that justification is the start of your Christian life, and now that you're justified, you can begin a, work, a, a, a life of determining how you'll stand at the judgment seat. No, justification is your stand before the judgment seat. You don't graduate from justification. It covers your whole life. If you live by, if you believe on the name of Jesus, you're justified, and then you walk by faith in what you don't see. You believe in his promise. And this idea of working meritoriously for rewards, as if the rewards you receive are somehow a debt God owes you for your valuable service is just to, is not scriptural um let's look at jesus talked about this how we're to view our service he says uh but you which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say to him by and by when he's come from the field go and sit down to meet and will not rather say to him make ready till I eat and gird my, thyself and serve me till I've eaten and drunken, and afterwards you shall sit down and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that are commanded him? I don't think so. So likewise you, when you have done these things which you are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which is our duty to do. Okay. So... And this is in Luke. This is Luke is a grace gospel. Luke was friends with Paul. And you see Paul's law grace paradigm shining all through this uh, gospel where he raises the demand and then shows you you can't meet the demand and then shows you that salvation is the answer and salvation is impossible for man, but everything is possible with God. But when he talks about your service, what does he say here? He wants you, how do you, how are you supposed to estimate your service? Well, we're unprofitable. Even if we do do good, our service right, we're only doing what we're asked to do. That's not profitable, believe it or not. It's not spectacular. It's not something that you get a thanks for if you're just... You know, I remember my mom used to say, I'd clean my room or something, which was one of the things I was supposed to do. And I would say, well, I cleaned my room today, you know. And she's like, what, you want a reward? You're, that's what I've told you to do. That's just the rules of you being in my house. <laughs> so... Then what's spectacular? Be and then think about it this way. You have flesh. How many of your works have been purely motivated by your love for Christ and for others and with no thought to yourself? No thought to your reputation. No thought to how you look. No thought to any kind of earthly gain or even a thanks. You know, Jesus said if you... Uh, if you get thanks from men, let's say they clap hands for you, that's you, you got your reward. That's it. Congratulations. You know, if you do your works to be seen by men, you have your reward when they go, oh, praise God, you're a really good brother. You know, no, we don't want that. We want the father who sees in secret to reward us openly. So still, though, the flesh taints everything. 
And someone who's conscious of grace and has been brought to an understanding of grace is someone who's also pretty familiar with his flesh and how much I'm in the flesh, it seems like, all the time. Everything that I'm supposed to do, I, even if I do it, it's tainted with my flesh and my bad attitude of my different things, you know? It's amazing. It, now, I don't even think like that anymore. I don't judge myself that way anymore because I've taken the concept of reward for work off the table. I am not considering a reward as a debt that God owes me for my profitable service. I see that my service is fairly unprofitable whenever I'm motivated by that. Anytime you get motivated by um, a, getting a something that's like a debt owed to you in exchange for your works, you're brought right into the flesh. And it becomes taxing, and you can't do it, and you do it with a bad attitude, and you begin to hate it. Honestly. I mean, that's just the way it works. It becomes mammon to you, and you and, and it fills you with wrath. Um, so I've taken that off the table for myself, and it's interesting because now... When I do do something, I just do it because I want to. I want to teach the word. And I can feel the unction when I do it. I can feel an anointing when I do it. And people say, oh, that helped me, that helped me. I'm surprised at all of it, you know, really. Do I think I'm really profitable? No. Uh, Not most of my Christian life. Do I expect a reward for this and that? No, I can't say I do. Now, the other thing is remember that Jesus talked about the 11th hour laborers and how they get the same reward as the ones who've been working in the field all day. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, okay. And when they came, they that were hired at about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. That's their wage. And when the first came, the ones that had been working all day, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These have wrought but one hour, and you made them equal to us? Would you have borne the burden in the heat of the day? But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do not, uh, I do thee no wrong. Didn't you agree to work with me for a penny? Take that which yours is and go your way, and I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the first shall be last and the last first, for many are called a few chosen. What is he saying here? He's saying, Look, you agreed at the onset of the terms and then you worked your whole life. And then this late camera came in and he worked just a little and time was up and I rewarded him the same. Why? Because I'm good. Neither of you are profitable according to Luke. Right. Uh, but I, out of the goodness of my heart have chosen to reward everyone equally. Um, And, you know, you'd say, didn't you agree with me for this? What did we agree with? We agreed that we would, we didn't even think about serving the Lord, or I didn't. I thought, I'm a wretched sinner, and I'm doomed, and I need someone to save me. And Jesus said, I'll give you eternal life. And I said, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take Christ. Well, now that I know what eternal life is, it's not just me living forever. It's Christ himself as my life and my reward and my joy and my hope and all the riches that he has shared with me as an inheritance. I realize if I have a reward, it's merely a partaking of his reward. I don't think that I'm going to be rewarded for this and that and this and that. Now, Um, I don't have time to develop this much further here. I'm already 45 minutes into this thing, but I do feel led to talk about it. And I thought, well, in Smyrna, Smyrna, they talk about the crown of life there. The crown of life is just a crown that you've already received. Remember he said in uh, Church of Philadelphia, uh, take heed to what you have and let no one steal your crown. Take heed that no one steals your crown. Hold fast to that which you have. We already have a crown. I guarantee we have the crown of life. And we enjoy it most when we're in situations where we need the help of the Holy Spirit, either to get through temptation or to get through persecution. 
we find that he renews us within and we find at the end of the trial a sweeter sense of the Lord's presence and a sweeter knowledge of him than we had before the trial. What is that? That's a, that's a taste of life. And that is our crown. We will be crowned with that at one day, but it's his life in us. It's not our life. We didn't do anything. How You know, when trouble comes and I want to quit, sometimes I do want to quit when people call me all kinds of names and do videos about me. Why don't I? Is it because I am really stalwart and I have decided to do this thing? No, it's like the disciples said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. To whom else will we go? I've found that all of my treasure resides in him. I can't leave him. What am I going to do? But like Polycarp said when he was eventually martyred, he said, you know, my Lord has been my friend for these 80 years. How can I turn away from him now? It's your life. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You'll find that you endure. And I, I, I've, used, I've used this example before, but early on in my Christian life, a pastor told me the Christian life is one of resurrection. And it's, uh, it's like a buoy. No matter how far you push the buoy down under the water, it always springs back to the top. You'll find that that's true. No matter what trial you go through, no matter what trouble you get into, no matter where you go, life will always win. Life will always come up. When you're weak, he's strong. When you go down, he comes up within you. And when he brings you up, you're, excuse me, you have a stronger taste of him than you did before you went down. So that to me is the crown of life. Now, as far as the other crowns and the rewards, you know, I will eventually do a study of that. Um, my feeling, though, is that we've got to get rid of this meritorious concept of works. Uh, works um, earning us a debt from God. You're going to be miserable if you are under that. It's Those are works of the flesh. Anytime you put yourself, put God, try to put God in debt to you for your works, you're now in the flesh. And your works are works of the flesh. And they'll be filled with hypocrisy. But if you just serve out of your enjoyment of the Lord, and you serve by enjoying the Lord, and you share your joy of the Lord with others, you'll enjoy it, whether you're rewarded or not. You won't even think about the reward. And yet, Christ will be your reward. And that's what he said to Abraham, is if you're not, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. Christ is our reward. All of the so-called crowns, are nothing if they're not Christ himself. Because he's the only imperishable thing there is. He is the eternal one, and he's our life. Okay, I gotta get going. I'm gonna listen to this back and see if it's worth a post.